unfamiliar with and kind of scared to go to. <laughs> you know, that was a, the south, uh, southeastern part of Ohio has some really weird history. I remember at the time there was a, a Steubenville, one of those towns, had a cop that was up front that he was in the KKK and wouldn't get fired for that. I have no idea how that got booked. I mean, how does that happen? It was supposed to be the offbeats, and for some reason they couldn't play or make it or some reason they didn't want to play or make it or something but they said hey could zero defects do it well when we pulled into town we saw that one of those big signs that uh, they had the big arrow and the, you know and punk flashing, rock you know it said tonight punk night you know and a flashing arrow so all the redneck hillbilly you know truck driving rifle carrying town locals people, the locals yeah they were all cruising around you know hey Pump night. <laughs> that sounds like fun. There's this bar full of guys, farmer guys, with born and raised corn, big dudes with born and raised corn on their hats and stuff. It was a bad vibe from the minute we pulled into town. It was like a setup almost. And as I recall, we got, we did, uh, we did a bomb. Don't be a bomb <laughs> Set, Jimmy turns around, his, his mic goes clean out, and there is, uh, shows me the mic cord. It's cut clean in half, like with a knife. And uh, so, you know, that worried me a little, a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> Sat down, I pulled out my knife, and I started cutting all the plastic off the cord. I remember that. And I grabbed the duct tape and I took the red wires and twisted them together and duct taped them, took the black wire and twisted them, duct taped them, took the white wires, duct taped them, wrapped it all back together, check, 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 and we yeah. continued. I was sitting at the bar with Sue and I remember she goes, she goes hey mate, have you ever been in a fight? <laughs> said, no, I've never been in a fight. <laughs> said, oh, okay. <laughs> Some of the girls from the bar were walking by and one of them just looked up at me and said, why is your hair so short? Because I had a skinhead at the time. And I just said, well, why is your hair so greasy? The girl tried to swing at Sue, and Sue just popped her right in the, right, right between the eyes. Bam, and her glasses broke in two, like, like broke right in the middle and went both ways. Yeah, and her glasses went flying, and she started yelling about her glasses, and then some guys came up. And whoever was at that door, maybe me and Vince or somebody, kind of like started pushing them back out the door. It was like, you know how gazelles or, you know, deer or like animals come in, you know, and, the, and they just look at each other, you know, they just like, there's no, no words were said, you know, we're just, you know, and then all of a sudden one of the guys just hauled off and belt Tommy Strange right in the jaw. And I got hit, I went over the drum kit, when I got from behind the drum kit, I remember seeing, I think it was Sue and uh, Mikey hitting people with wooden chairs over their back. <laughs> And this is the image I remember, that it looked like some kind of weird slow motion, like action film. That's where the pile started, and I was at the bottom of the pile, and somehow my leg was just twisted, like, like so, and the pile just kept, you know, getting heavier and heavier, so, you know, I crawled out from under the pile, but I shouldn't have done that because there was just chairs flying everywhere, you know, you could, like, it was like an old west 
movie, you know. I remember chairs flying and bottles busting and, oh God. The bar owner was just you know, having a cow. Gentlemen, you don't know what you're doing to me. Please, I got a large family. A couple guys started punching me and I just covered my head and held up a peace sign, actually. <laughs> just trying to get some mojo to keep away from my PA system. Peace, peace. I didn't just run to the to the toilet. I ran to the women's toilet because I thought I thought that's the the, the best place because they're not going to come in the girls' toilet. And trying to keep Sue from getting beat up because the guys again thought she was a guy and wanted to beat her up. I just remember putting her behind me and yelling, and then no one hit me. No one hit me, but then I ran into it all, and that's when the cops came. They watched us so that we wouldn't get killed or something, and we all packed up and got a police escort right out of town. Yeah, so the punk rockers had to be saved by the cops. <laughs> Red, white, and blue coming for you. <laughs> you know, and the next day I just crawl, I had to crawl to the bus, crawl to the uh, Kent State, you know, health center, and, uh, had they x-rayed it, and you know, like, boy, you got a fractured ankle. And so I had a cast for like six months. But, uh, that's the last time we played Dover. <laughs> <laughs> punk rock mm. the, I mean it's it, it, there's an attitude and that attitude can be put into a category that now is called punk rock and but that's an attitude that's been there before there was ever a punk rock suddenly this president this stupid president named Reagan was elected and you're just like how can a bad b-movie actor that starred with a monkey be our president we are totally doomed <laughs> I walked in a record store and the first Ramones album had just come out and these guys behind the counter had a promo copy and they were playing it and making fun of it and I go, what's that? They go, the Ramones, I'm like, so I bought it. That was probably the last thing they expected they were just putting it on there for a laugh. I figured these guys began to kind of look like complete dicks, you know, like the kind of guys that I hated in high school. So if they didn't like it, there must be something to it. I think it was a much more democratic scene than a city that was developed enough that it could have, like, segments where, you know, all of the political bands would be in this corner and all the pop bands would have to do this and all the sort of, like, stylized rock and roll bands would have to be over there. We all had to be together. and. You know, it made a better scene because of that, because I because we were all in the same you know we were rolling around in the same rooms together. We were all the kids that maybe were picked on and you know we're different and we need to get together and be a clan. People just made it up. I mean, we we there were no rules to follow. We just made it up as we went along. I started in college knowing that I was going to get out of school and have a job with Goodyear. And when I got out of school, there was no, there weren't any, any jobs to be found. So we started playing music and making four bucks a night. I like David Bowie, and of course, you know, David Bowie worked with Iggy Pop, and so that's how I got into Iggy and the Stooges and all that. And I actually have a tape that's really awesome of Iggy on the Afternoon Exchange in Cleveland with Fred and Wilma, a live performance at the Agora. It's, it's really good. I taped it off the TV when I was a kid. So what, what, what is it New Wave? Is it punk rock? Is it, what is it? And why? <laughs> well, it's 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 uh, I guess I guess they call it punk rock, don't they? Okay. I don't know. You don't stick pins in your cheek or anything, or do you? No, I haven't done for years. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering. I think it's very good music that should be taken seriously. Oh no, right. I believe me, I'm I'm the last one yeah. to you know. I like this stuff. There's yeah. a lot of. In fact, uh, this is of course rock and roll capital of the uh, of the world or something. Yeah, Cleveland. We've got Ohio. some great some great I bands know. here. And a lot of great new wave groups have come mm -hmm. out of here, including uh, my God, the Lepers. 
And, uh, also, well, that's the only one that comes to mind. But uh, Well, my friends Devo come from uh, Akron. That's right, from Akron. Akron near here. Yeah. Up at Quaker Square, Mark Mothersbaugh had a stamp shop there. And we'd hang around there and see what they were into. And then uh, they played at the Akron Art Institute. It's like, hey, you want to come see our band? Oh, you have a band? Sure. And in front of about 30 people, they had video screens, they had plastic suits where they look like embryos wiggling around on the floor. I'm like, this is beautiful. My mom knew Jimmy Zero that worked at a record store up at Southland back then, and he told her about his band called The Dead Boys, and we... I remember I bought the Dead Boys album mm -hmm. then. All my friends were listening to Styx and Loverboy and it's that one band Journey. And I just didn't, I, I couldn't take that. And shortly after I also got a uh, cassette of the Dead Boys and within a few months after that I saw the Rubber City Rebels for the first time. We still had the tire in the um, drum kit. <laughs> You absorb it after a period of time, it grows on you, you know? At first, you're like, it's too much. Then after a while, you start liking it, get used to it. Then you start wanting it, you know? You start wanting to hear it. My mother is Scottish, and every month or so, her parents would send her newspapers from Scotland, rolled up in a bundle wrapped in brown paper with candy in the middle for the kids. And I would always look at the newspapers, and I remember starting to see pictures in the tabloid newspapers of Scotland of punk rockers, probably about 1976. Before I had even really heard the music, I was fascinated by the look. Cleveland was very brainwashed by WMMS, you know, they told them what was cool, they told them what they should listen to, and, and most people weren't uh, smart enough to see through that. Or, think for themselves really. My uncle's the one who started turning me on to kind of like, you know, non-WMMS, you know, kind of bands like stuff like the Plasmatics and the Ramones and Blondie and Devo and stuff like that. And uh, then basically in high school I met a couple of people like Doug Gillard and Fraser Sims and uh, we were basically the only people in the school who, uh, you know, were into the whole punk rock thing. So we got a band together. Uh, originally called Burning Theater, and then we changed it to Starvation Army. Death of Samantha and, of course, Guided by Voices. But he was not as into the hardcore sound as we were. Well, my first band was the Decapitators, which eventually turned into the dark. <laughs> Scott and Dave were in fifth, and 
he was a nut. But um, it was, you know what? It, it was actually of all things hearing the Dead Boys on um, 105. They actually played uh, the cover of I Need Lunch, and I heard it on the radio. I was like, this is pretty cool. Think about how suffocating a time that was. Just to look what was being played on radio, what was on TV. Um, I mean, there wasn't any such thing as fanzines. There wasn't really an alternative or small press to speak of, and except in the big cities. It was on my 18th birthday. Some friends of mine decided to take me out, and we went to a bar called the Robin Hood in Kent, where this band called Hammer Damage was playing, and. Uh, that was the big hook for me. I saw these guys and I just couldn't believe the type of music that I was witnessing. Just fast, aggressive, energetic, like nothing I ever heard. We went to Garbage Incorporated, that's what it was called. And uh, when we saw Jimmy and the prankster uh, Tommy Strange, he goes, let's blood fuck these guys. <laughs> we were like totally scared. <laughs> Look mine, man. If you're going to be a wannabe or a hanger-on in, in Cleveland or Akron, there's something seriously wrong with you. Cleveland was more punk, rock, and, and the African, they're the ones who started the um, hardcore, in my opinion. They were more of the very heavy, and real hard fast, or right, and they, songs more they like my threat. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. more like yeah. So they, and then they, they kind of came up towards Cuban. So they were more, they were. Yes. <laughs> and all that stuff sound, I mean, today it sounds tame, but back then that was really actually scary sounding music. You know? A lot of the original ideas weren't coming from Philadelphia and New York. In, in, in places like that. They were coming from like places like Akron, Cleveland. I mean, this is where all this stuff was starting. If punk and hardcore wasn't invented in London or New York or Los Angeles, it would have been invented in Cleveland. And uh, it might have been invented there anyways in 1972 with the Electric Eels. Oh, I'm so entertaining, so entertaining, run through a washing machine. All the elements were there for it to begin. We had a, uh, a deteriorating uh, city, rampant uh, unemployment, and we had a mayor, uh, two mayors actually, that everyone liked to make fun of, one of whom uh, was quite good at lighting his hair on fire. We had the primordial stew of punk rock there. I mean, I'd never heard any other hardcore band. I've never heard of I, I understand maybe some existed at the time, but I never heard of them. But it was just more of a, an attitude. Me and Dave were just jamming in our basement, and uh, 
my brother started getting us in like the Stooges, you know, Ramones. It's just, it's like, this is what we wanted. This music was like what I wanted to hear, you know. Don't go kill Chris. <laughs> area in the early 80s. Come up here and say that, motherfucker! You had to work. If you wanted to see a band, you had to find this band and get them to come and play in somebody's basement or in some storefront somewhere. There weren't all these clubs around that you could just go to to see these bands like you could in bigger cities. You had to make it happen. Dead Boys were, you know, they went to New York, but they're from Cleveland. The Cramps are from Cleveland. They went to New York to get very famous. Chrissy Hine was from Akron. But again, anybody that gets famous leaves Cleveland to do it. Devo, um, you know, they leave Cleveland and then get famous. It's just not a, it's not a, a music industry place. It's a blue collar steel town. The industrial sounds, all the foundries and the plants. Like even next to my dad's house there was a factory with always a, you know, a noise going on and I think a big inspiration for us was just all the local stuff, like Tom turned me on to the Electric Eels, the Pagans, the Lepers. Tom played What's This Shit Called Love by the Pagans for me over the phone and that was, that was the moment. That was like, I'm selling all my Zeppelin records.
Hell was just a club in name only. It was at various locations. And when, whenever we decided to have a show, we were well, oh, cool. let's, let's have a show at a hall somewhere. They'd call it Club Hell. And Club Hell was a moving club, and it would move from place to place. It was never in the same place twice until the Dale. That was part of the way of punk rock, you know. I mean, nobody wanted you, so you just had to kind of slip in and then get out. Walked out of a movie theater and got hit by a car and, and uh, cut my chin. And in L.A., you could get some money if you cut your chin because that's facial disfigurement. So I had <laughs> so seven grand. That was whew, we called hippie rich. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I wish I would have bought that other PA system from Akron Music. Two days later, we found, but I bought this ancient, uh, <laughs> looked like a spaceship. Well, the big room is where the Misfits played, but they would have wedding receptions. They'd have a lot of, uh, like, church groups. So, you know, we rented it as a hall. Well, we ended up getting the Dale, which was right. the perfect deal. Yes. We could get kids in if we X their hands, which was perfect. The Dale was, uh, I don't know, it seemed like it was about 10 by 20 feet. It, it was sort of a, a college, maybe a frat bar, had sort of a vaguely Irish theme to it. You think about, you know, alternative clubs or punk rock clubs today, and, you know, you picture, like, black walls and, you know, like a big PA system and, uh, you know, lights and yada, yada, yada. That was like uh, wood paneling and, like, shamrocks on the yeah. walls. A, a small corner bar and we approached them and said look we've got some rather unusual music and a pretty good crowd of people we can get, get in here and really get your bar business going to a little bit. <laughs> so after the first night he uh, I think he was a little shocked by it. He definitely felt instantly akin to a few certain scenes. One was the Lansing, Michigan scene with the Crucifix, and one was uh, the Akron scene with uh, Jimmy and, and, and Vince. After uh, they played John Wayne was a Nazi, the guy's like, you know, the KKK wasn't all bad. They just used to get together for barbecues and stuff. <laughs> They had big names, like a lot were coming from Michigan, I remember. For a while it was like at least every other week we yeah. had a show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and always a national band well, and a bunch M of... MDC. <laughs> That must have been Rock Against Racism. Yeah, probably R.A.R. -E -R. Uh, probably Rock Dixon and D.R.I. And the scene carried Garrett Floyd up, carried him around the room. Um, the East Coast bands that came out to play, New Jersey's Finest. Cause for Alarm and yeah. Vatican Command. No, yeah. not them. Yeah, Vatican Commandos. Yeah, yeah. The Crucifix used to come by there. Oh, yeah. Doc would come in there and sing and puke and, you know, did his thing. It was always a, a lot of fun. <laughs> playing at the Dale. <laughs> this little like living room size place. That was long before they were famous, of course. They, I guess they were famous for like the 15 people that were at the Dale. That's that's back when the old stage diving trick used to happen where we'd climb up on top of an open door, have people, you know, gather around everybody, you know, while the music's playing. I'm gonna jump and you catch me. <laughs> so we'd leap off and like this little huddle of people would grab people and, Grab you and carry you around, you know. 
people would stage dive, but there was no stage, so they climb up on the pool table. And the, the owner would like put plywood over the pool table, so people would wreck the pool table during these punk shows, and people would dive off of it. Yeah, Michelle was, was one of dive. the rare girls that would yeah. stage dive. Oh, and, stage dive. Yeah. Mine was the pinball machine. <laughs> I remember pulling a mattress up to the uh, side of the garage, and then when Zero Defects were playing, I would climb up on the garage and jump onto this mattress, and pretty soon everybody was doing it then. It must have been happening in other parts of the country, too, but because it sort of all culminated into what's going on today. You go to, I mean, shit, you go to almost any show, and they're stage diving. It's like Christian Rock. They're <laughs> Christian Rock. stages. <laughs> it was fun. I mean, the scene was cool, and the people were cool and stuff, but the music, I thought, was pretty much noise. And, uh... The pinkles came about by just saying, well, shit, we could, we could make noise, too, but make it a lot more fun. We were pretty much anti-hardcore. Are you ready, Dick? Ready! Start it, then. this tall standing straight up like a sail in the wind and it's 1982 let me remind you people used to drive by and throw shit at us and want to kill us just at the fuck you asshole <laughs> you don't even know me or who i am you're driving by and you're that angry about this what the fuck <laughs> it was too funny i was the most like um fascist guy in the scene or something you could say i worked at a nuclear power plant but before that i worked for, uh, a subcontractor from Ghoul that was building torpedoes. So. <laughs> I was like the most politically incorrect guy. <laughs> Even though everybody's like, oh, Tom, no, he's pretty mild, man. Or, yeah, well, behind the scenes, he's, he's building weapons for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I was a respiratory therapist at St. John and West Shore Hospital, so I would dress in my whites, and then in the nighttime I'd go out dress in black. I had um, a shaved head with a pink mohawk, and I tell you what, my mother stuck with me, like, you know, she never put me down, she never made me feel weird, but now, when I ask her about it, she says she was humiliated, she says that, that she just had to grind her teeth to take me anywhere with her, because, you know, she just couldn't stand the stairs and whatever, but she never laid that on me. I was working at the Boy Scouts at the time. I was sort of a public relations guy for the, the local council. And we were playing at the uh, hardcore house over near uh, City Hospital. 
and it was where uh, you know it was where everybody, a bunch of people lived there, and they were had they had free shows there. They had some pretty good shows. I think, in fact, I think the band that night was Millions of Dead Cops. And people heard that MDC was playing, and the cops had found out. We were on the way to Europe, and we went straight from San Francisco, played that house party in Akron, where everybody was holding everybody up. And then from there, we were like off. And uh, so, sure enough, we were playing, and it did get raided. So I ran out the front. And one of the cops was actually a scout leader or something, and he, you know, I, I, I don't know if he noticed me or if he, uh, if he just didn't recognize me because I didn't have a mohawk or anything like that, and I was just blended into the woodwork. We started our own business doing yard service. You know, we bought some ladders and we bought some scrapers and some paint brushes and a chainsaw and stuff you need to go out and knock on someone's door and go, hey, we're in your neighborhood and we want to... So how did that go over with the way you guys looked? Going around to... Well, I usually let Andy go do the sales pitch because he looked like any other guy in Akron pretty much at the time. I got fired from that job, though. So. From the missile one? Yeah, that's how I kept my punk credentials. I worked there, but they fired me. with uh, the jocks and the jock mentality but later on I recognized that we were behaving in our own very jock-like way it was a lot of testosterone I yeah. think and instead of playing football or basketball we went out and we slammed it yeah. it appeared on the outside to be rough but it really was no more rough than a uh, than a uh, you know friendly tag football or tackle football game that you had with your friends you dived into the crowd you'd be up for a long time, and, and you could just swim on top of them and roll around and flip around. And sometimes you'd almost fall, and right before you got to the ground, you'd go back <laughs> up again, you know? Was, you'd like say, I'm gonna try and fall, and you couldn't, because people wouldn't let you down. To me, slamming was a form of motion poetry. When we would hit each other, nine times out of 10 in our dance floors, it was a thing where you hit and you traded energy. It just kind of went on, and you, or you went over, and it was like acrobatics. I mean, I when I slammed, I was, it was like acrobatics. When that mosh pit got going, it looked like all hell had broke loose. But generally, the more people were doing it, the safer it was. And then we'd grab each other and use each other's body weight to throw ourselves around. You know, and do the chicken slam, and you know, two people just having a chicken fight while dancing. And I think it was more for fun and dancing, and, and just getting out and having a good time, like young people back then wanted to do, rather than uh, rather than getting out, and getting hurt, and getting arrested, and the things that were going on in L.A. What I saw in the L.A. scene, I saw the energy, but it was getting way out of hand. Do you remember Tim Dunbar from Positive Violence? He came in from uh, San Diego and he had SDSH, which meant San Diego Skinheads. And he always talked about those guys beat up people at gigs all the time. But when he came here, it was a whole different ball game. I'll never forget, he made a spike wristband that had nails on it. I remember Jimmy and Vin just threw him to the ground and made him take it off. One time Frazier quoted in uh, uh, upon the uh, inception of our band Positive Violence over there, uh, he was describing me as uh, Tim. Ow, watch them spikes from San Diego. Yeah, they definitely asked me to, to take off my spikes, and, uh, and, and I did. Whenever we had a Club Hell show, if you came in with your spikes, that was cool. But if you wanted to dance, you had to take your spikes off. That was just a, a rule. And it wasn't our rule as much as it was the group rule. And the group was the same group all the time. The Guns, the Dark, the Offbeats, the Starvation Army, the Urban Mutants, Agitated, Zero Defects. Some of us had those spikes 
because we would get jumped walking the streets and we it gave us that ability to look a little more vicious and to possibly protect ourselves if if it came down to that. All you had to do was have short hair and maybe a leather jacket on it. You might get the shit kicked out of you in certain places. So I'm standing in the club and all of a sudden someone like jumps me. It's not like someone fucking around with you. I mean they jump me. So I turn around and swamp and I had those big fucking spike wrist, wrist bracelets. And it was a female cop here in the neck. And just First sliced her neck. I was like, oh shit. One night, uh, me and Mike were leaving uh, one of the shows that were going on at the lakefront. And we were walking to our car. And um, two jock guys started yelling at him, making fun of him for his mohawk. And they actually tackled me down and... Beat you um, both up. Beat <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, no, we, it we, wasn't put, we put up a good fight. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, but I remember the Freezer Theater. We uh, we just we pulled into the freezer and we were uh, we going into our first tune and then Jimmy just did a big stage dive. He just took a running start. And, <laughs> and that's the first time I ever saw anybody stage dive. That's, uh, and luckily, you know. Got me back up on stage for the next song. <laughs> but then, but then, they were dancing in the, down in the pit. And I remember someone started wanting to beat on Vince or somebody. And I stopped the show and I started one of my... Who's fighting and what? Yeah, who's fighting, fighting and why? <laughs> <laughs> one of those. Got them to mellow out, and there were you can see, I have pictures of the show, and you can see there's these big skinheads sitting right up front, you know, by the stage, looking all like they do. <laughs> I mean, I saw some bad things happen, but it was all accidents. <laughs> Much fights. There was that that one gig in Cleveland, next to the McDonald's, where the jocks came and stomped a couple heads. It was Tom's gigs. Uh, it the was fuck, like the team the hangout you call in those South Euclid yeah. or whatever. Like all yeah. the high school kids. All the were fucking there. jocks came out there to, to whip up on some punk rockers and kick some ass. It was a uh, it was a benefit to raise money for the New Hope, and we had Megan Approach. Agnostic Fun Cause for Long, who came up and played for free along with the Dark, and I think Soylent Green played. And maybe One Spider of the Shen bands named Soylent Green. And what happened is some kids that went to McDonald's to get some food got messed with. And so Tommy, just, Tommy Strange said there's trouble. Went over there. It was like the cover of uh, that SSD record, the kids yeah. will have their say. They're all like, and they walked over there. It was like the same thing. Like Tommy Strange, I just remember him rushing out of the thing and he just got up on cars and, and he's like, boo boo on the road, on the car. You guys fucking want some? some something like that. It scared those fuckers off. <laughs> no, I don't think that was me. Because <laughs> he, he remembers it and, uh, and the, guy, the other guy, the guitar player. Uh, for, uh, I was probably the one that was yelling for everybody to do it and then stayed behind to watch the equipment. <laughs> What has been your worst show that you've ever played? Worst show? Oh, Toledo, okay. two weeks ago. Yeah, Toledo. <laughs> that was, well, that was not Paul Toledo. We all packed in a van, and that, that gig was freezing cold too, and uh, went to uh, Toledo and did this show there, and I think, I don't know, I don't know if Zero Defects, did they even get to play before this huge fight broke out? I don't think so, yeah. Actually. Yeah, I yeah. And I was carrying my, my head up the stairs, it was on the second floor, and as I was carrying it up, a guy was coming down and he headbutted me <laughs> on the way down. He just goes, oh! <laughs> and I'm carrying my gear, and I was like, oh! <laughs> you know, and I'm still trying to walk up the steps, and that wasn't even like, hey, how you doing, or anything. We didn't even play. You are a rock and roll survivor. He just headbutted me for no reason. <laughs> they all made their way in, and you know, next thing you know, it was like this huge rumble inside the club, and you know, people getting duped left and right. And then the other time we played in Toledo, they were beating somebody up in the parking lot and trying to rip the guy's car door off. And we were done, and we were loading up, and I go, hey, just let him go. He's in his car. Let him go. And then they went like this. I go, I'm in the van. Don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, they were, that guy, they beat the hell out of that guy. I went to the door, I go, I want paid right now because the police are on their way. 
and they gave me like 80 bucks and then I go 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I find, to found Toledo to be kind of a rough town I had um, tried drugs and alcohol prior to becoming straight edge uh, when I was probably about 15 years old. And coincidentally, I had decided to drop it and not do that anymore. And it, it was about that same time I had uh, heard about this straight edge movement outside of, uh, out of uh, D.C. basically, uh, minor threat. And I was probably officially straight edge for about a year, but I became permanently associated with it afterwards because I had a straight edge tattoo that Vince Rancid did. Drugs and drinking was your rite of passage and it was so synonymous with fun to do drugs and drink, well suddenly there's this alternative to that. And that was all it was. It was like, no, you don't have to. And that was amazing to me. Seems like some people want to end their life now or try to slowly end their life now. And some people want to use every second of their life as best they can. I was always completely against the whole uh, gang mentality and jack bullshit that went with all the straight edge stuff. There was another straight edge band on the scene some years later and apparently I think they had uh, put a price on my head um, to anybody who would kill me because I was seen drinking a beer with uh, a straight edge that time. Wow. Cleveland people seem to like their drugs and alcohol and the Akron people didn't seem to care for that lifestyle as much, so that caused a little of a conflict. The, the scene basically split in two, and it was over ideological issues. And uh, I think what happened was some of the people who later ended up in the Cleveland contingent felt that the Akron scene was losing a sense of humor and becoming over-politicized. So I remember walking up to the house where I was staying, the punk house, and finding my forlorn little uh, tube of uh, Old Spice aftershave <laughs> in the snow. And I brought it in and I said, hey, what, what happened to my deodorant? And the same person who had thrown the, the uh, Offbeats tape across the room and said, uh, oh, deodorant, you know, that's fascist. <laughs> Okay, I dropped out of school a couple years into the, this experience and I went down to Florida and then came back to Ohio and went to nursing school from 1986 to 1988 and uh, I was a nurse for a while and then being a nurse got me into heavy drugs and then I became a heroin addict while I was still being a nurse. And then four years ago, I got caught stealing drugs from a place where I worked. And so they took my nursing license away from me. And now I waitress at the local Cracker Barrel. But uh, I'm in a good place. I really am. Things are better for me than they've been in a long time. <laughs> Women were conspicuous by their absence, almost, so that when you did notice a woman, it was a big event. It was almost like you'd go up to your friend and say, hey, there's a girl. There's a girl. There weren't a lot Guys of women. There, there really weren't. There was a handful. There was a handful. I mean, you know, like it, was, us, it was probably Liz, got Romano. 10 to 1. I'm it wasn't that there was no girls. It was a different kind of girls, and those kind of girls are few and far between. The women that were involved were like, kind of the epitome of the uh, of strong women that you always find found through punk rock in the 80s and early 90s, you know. We were kind of ignored a little bit and we decided that we needed to band together and be something and we started our own gang, came up with the um, name Fester, 
The biggest shock to me when I was in L.A. is that the girls couldn't dance. I mean, hell, you couldn't even get close enough to see the bands without getting hurt because the guys were just so stupid and rough. And uh, so to me, it was a big relief to come home. And here we had a hardcore scene at home, and the girls could actually get involved and go dance, you know, push around and not get killed because the guys weren't idiots. There was For years, it was down. very cool. Like, and girls could get up there and have fun. There's the mosh pit which I did participate in and I sustained um, several injuries over the, the years um, and at, at one point I ended up backing out and, and realized that the moshing had gotten a little too violent um, for my taste but you know we, a few of us tried to stick it out. You know the urban mutants had Danielle. She was a great screamer nobody could do what Danielle did ever. <laughs> slow bad rules right when they were getting good they got too good they uh, they, they came out at the Knights of Columbus Hall show in Cleveland all bandaged up <laughs> they were bad again <laughs> Club Hell show where the Misfits played. Uh, Vicky, remember her, Vicky Femiani? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 That was the first time that I noticed um, uh, a girl slam dance. And it was, it was Vicky Femiani. And, uh, of course, I fell in love. Dragon <laughs> To all our shows, pretty much. Uh, usually, we couldn't get. Oh, say who Jamie is. Though. Oh, Jamie's my daughter, who was, I think, uh, she was four and five, yeah. And she went to all our shows, and um, you know, when she got tired, all of us would throw our coats down and make a bed and cover her up, and, and then someone would always stand there and watch and keep an eye, and you know, usually me or you know, someone I trusted. And uh, yeah, she, uh, you know. It was just her way of life. How did you get into punk? I was born into I it. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember being probably, I guess, a toddler and, you know, sleeping on the jukebox at a, <laughs> at a punk gig, you know. I remember getting a lot of attention for being, you know, the only kid in the place. And well, yes, I feel no. very blessed in being brought up with so many phases of my parents lives even though they were singing beat up the brat with a baseball bat I <laughs> and child. I knew they weren't talking about me and child eaters <laughs> was our favorite song child while eaters you were... yes <laughs> and they were really good parents go figure okay, well thank you Jamie <laughs> thank you there was these girls that were showing up at all the shows that we went to they were sort of short in stature you know yay high or whatever they were uh, small and uh, so we just named them the Munchkin Girls. You always knew they were uh, there because you would hear, <laughs> Yay! After every song. <laughs> they were they were like the scene back then. They were always at every show. Just not just our shows, but a lot of everyone's shows. You know, I mean, some of those shows we played, man, there were 
you know, five people at, and four of them, you know, were the mall hands, you know, so that was really cool. Sometimes a lot of people didn't come out, but we made sure that the band felt welcome. Yeah, and, and, and appreciated. That, and, right, and knew that they were good. Yeah. I mean, you, you got... It didn't matter how many tickets they sold, right. as long as we were there and we'd get scream into it. Mm -hmm. and whistle. Yeah. And, and most of the bands were good, so they you were excellent. Well, there was three of them, and then there was a fourth... Uh, sister and she was a little bit older than the others and we found out that actually the fourth one was their mom. She was going to college and there were some people that really got into the scene and then she started going out to Akron and then after that we started going out. And they, they really <laughs> must have been into the fall at that time because they seemed to ask us that quite a bit. Have you ever heard of the fall? They were really big music fans. They weren't just there to these shows just to hang out and that's one thing I really liked about them. No, we were just there for, I mean, the, the music. music was so much fun. It was such a, a adrenaline rush. outlet. Yeah, it was a rush. They lived in this really nice suburban house in Brook Park with their mother. And this house had absolutely nothing to do with punk rock. You would walk in there and it was the cleanest, nicest, warmest place you had been in days. My mom would make a huge kettle of spaghetti mm -hmm. or sloppy joes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, everyone would just drink, pig out, crash out. Yeah, we'd have the Listen. crash piles. Yeah. They have this big German Shepherd dog, it's called Toby. They're like, oh, Toby, Toby. You know, Toby seemed fairly cool. But then Toby has this like thing in its little brain where it just snaps like that and it just turns into a vicious killer and it's like, ah! And Toby would prowl the perimeter at night when everyone else had gone to bed and I'd be all alone on the couch and I would have to play dead well Toby came up and sniffed me and they were always like oh Toby he just has his little spells he's cool no Toby was retarded I think it literally really was retarded I was frightened of that dog though let's face it I know it happened to uh, I think Tim Kelly I think uh, maybe Joe got bit once okay. Toby bit me <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> True, Bob. Wow. Nobody was going to make a big deal about the dog because it would they have been uncool. Like, in other words, you know, they would take what, what came with the turf. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry that we couldn't have made their song a big hit and maybe given them some royalties. I remember when Tom Miller first God, came up and said, position. How do you feel if I write this song? And I was like, Oh, I don't know. As long as it's not offensive. And now when I I hear it, I just think, oh, that's totally cool because that was part of our scene. Well, it's a great song and it was a great idea and uh, it was a great question. <laughs> this next one's for the Munster Chicks. You know who you are. Another musical question. Why do you hang out? <laughs> gig in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, know what their excuse was, but they're like, oh, you know, there's no show. Like, what do you mean there's no show? <laughs> hey, you know, thanks for telling us. You know, I think the only person that we tracked down was like the janitor or something. He's like, oh, yeah, oh I don't know. He's kind of mumbling and stuff. <laughs> We're like, well, look. so finally, I think we called up the promoter who was like some kid living at his parents' house. 
So we drove out to like some <laughs> suburban street and shook them down for like $50. We had met this girl at a party in Colorado where we stayed all night. And in the morning she said, why don't you come to my house and you can have some breakfast. So we, <laughs> we proceeded to head to her house. It was a nice little suburban house. And we got comfortable. Uh, Tony started frying up some eggs and bacon. And Danny, our drummer at the time, Dan Phillips, went into the bathroom with the young lady and they decided to uh, um, bathe. And I, I look out the window and I see this gentleman approaching the house rapidly. And uh, he storms in and Tony says, good morning, you want some breakfast? And he looks around, doesn't say anything, and then says, who the hell are you and what are you doing in my house? Where's my daughter? Don't get to play, scream your guts out at each other for an hour, get in the van, be pissed off, yell, fight, get exhausted, and I couldn't stay awake. I drove for 90 minutes and then I stayed up for another hour or so and then I fell asleep. And then I woke up and it was like, da da da, the band's kind of bouncing around. I looked out, I see it's daylight and there's the road. And then I look and there's Scott on the wheel and he's just asleep. <laughs> and I look forward and we're in between the highway. We're not even on the highway. Like there's highway there and highway over there. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, we're in the grass in the middle. And I went to, like, I was going to grab the wheel and try to steady it. And then the drummer, Jim, like, taps. He goes, he goes, wait a second. He goes, Scott, Scott, wake up. And Scott was like, oh. And he goes, all right, hold on, pump the brakes, pump the brakes, hold on, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. And he talked him through it, and we slowed down and stopped. Well, I remember in Toledo when we drove up in Andy's van, he had a little hole in the back of his van and, and an exhaust pipe <laughs> like, led, led directly to the van. So we're all feeling like a little doppy, you know. So we're all about ready to go to sleep. And uh, luckily, we stopped at the rest stop and then we all we all pile out of this van at this rest stop. There are all kinds of normal people and just one weirdo freak after another jumps out of this van, you know, <laughs> red, blue hair, mohawks, you know, safety pins, you know, piercings, tattoos everywhere, you know. And I just remember that moms grabbing their kids, you know, and just <laughs> shielding them. But, uh, luckily, we survived the uh, monoxide. <laughs> I know, because me and Fraser were like, we found a hole that didn't lead to the exhaust pipe and we were taking turns Breathing. like sucking, <laughs> sucking air through that hole. And the rest of the uh, people in the van who hadn't been so wise as to suck oxygen in through the little holes in the side, they went reeling and stumbling out of the van. We said to each other, see, see, they're getting carbon monoxide poisoning and we're not. Yeah, I think we got that van after you guys. <laughs> <laughs> our, our best thing we ever did was go to Germany. Uh, somehow a Nazi submarine got there before we did. We were like, requesting it in Hamburg, and Hamburg was a big U-boat pen city, you know, and it was on the Elba River. We get there and they're like, hey, Nazi submarine! We're yeah, like, oh, we no, I don't we, know about you know? We went to Germany thinking, we better not put this on the set list. They just might not get it. Yeah, you know, and so, it's, they were like screaming. People were for asking for it, so we were like, <laughs> Okay. They Let's loved play. it. They dug it so much. It was funny.
Punk has like... ended for me hundreds of times. <laughs> every time I had a bad gig, every time I had a hangover, every time I uh, quit a band or was kicked out of one, Punk was over for me. But it was only to be reborn again. I never thought that after the hardcore scene and, and all that stuff that we were doing back then, the music, the intensity, the, the, the total, uh, I mean, nobody liked this stuff, including us, you know. Um, but I figured they'll never, that's the end, they'll never, the, the next generation will never be able to invent music that is worse than what we did. We did the worst music of all, and I was wrong. That's all I'll say about that. I stepped away from music and got into other art forms for my own personal self and I did listen to many other kinds of music all the way to the point where now I can appreciate a good polka you know because I appreciate the tradition of it you know and that's there well some polka bands are pretty kick-ass you know they kicked me out of the band at that point and my girlfriend dumped me and my car died, so I didn't have a car, I didn't have a band, I didn't have a girlfriend. I was just like, I gotta try something different, so I went to college instead. Like, we and Death and Samantha and some other bands like started out in that hardcore scene, and we just had like sort of different tastes that we eventually like either learned how to play our instruments you know, well enough to sort of play the kind of music that we thought we heard in our heads that was different. It was part of our life. We would just go out and have fun. And then when it ended, it was very sad because we had nowhere to go. And it was very sad. It was almost like a secret society. And people didn't know outside the movement, didn't really know hardly anything about it. And there were a lot of misconceptions about what it was and who was involved and what was going on. And, uh, but slowly but surely, I think we became our own worst enemy by, you know, letting the secret out. You know, it wasn't something that you could do and, and pal around with your friends anymore because there was just too many people involved. After I got out of the scene, I did not look at my pictures for years because I like felt like I was in mourning, like uh, <laughs> of being out of a scene that was so much powerful. Oh, it changed, you know. I mean, the music changed. The people left. The and bands, all the bars closed. The, band, the bars closed, and um, it was, you know, just it was the coolest. That you know, absolutely coolest, and and I'll always remember it. As for it being you know, really important a thing to me, like where you could go to a town and somebody be dressed a certain way or a certain show, and you could automatically strike up a conversation. You might even have a, well, you're probably going to have films and books in common, uh, probably politics. I mean, I think that stopped about late 80s. You know, it's obviously more of a, a fashion thing. I don't think people take it near as seriously as we used to. I'm always looking for kids to do something new. Yeah. Instead of re why repeat something? Here, here's a good way to sum it up. When I was in high school, there was two or three kids who had, you know, who wore combat boots and, you know, had mohawks and safety pins through their ears and whatnot. And when I went uh, to visit uh, uh, some friends of mine in my hometown about two or three years ago, I drove past my high school, and I swear to God, every kid standing out in front of the high school you know, we're dressed like, you know, a punk rocker or what, you know, what a punk rocker is supposed to look like now, I guess, you know, you know i.e. Marilyn Manson or something. Everything has a certain shelf life to where it's, where it's really in the moment and it's, it really has a certain type of energy that it probably never will have again. And I think that's what happened with hardcore and punk rock. What really ended it was, it was kind of economics for me. I, I, I was, had a job, I had a wife and a kid and, uh, uh, I got laid off from my job, so I started looking for other work, and I got a job offer in Florida, so I packed up and left, you know, and part of me looks back and feels like I missed out on the best years of the offbeats, because they really did do a lot of stuff, a lot of cool stuff, but then I hear some of the stories and the aggravations and the breakdowns and the, the missed gigs, and I hear those stories and I laugh, I'm just glad it wasn't me, you know. I still think this stuff is a lot of fun, I still really enjoy this type of music, uh, um, and, and I'm currently in a band now called the Chrome Kickers, which I think we're doing pretty well. We, we get out there and we, we rock hard with the, 
with the youngest of them. I don't think I've ever succumbed to um, the pressures of normal society. I don't have cable television. I travel a lot. I spend my money traveling probably. I mooch and rides off of people. And uh, I don't have health insurance. I think that's punk rock's fault. But I'm also like still skinny and still damn good looking. I think that's all because of punk rock too. It's, it's still always been there for me. I, I certainly spent a really good amount of time in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Anybody want some ice cream? Man. It's the ice cream man. <laughs> but uh, it's, ice cream is so punk rock. This one's 51%! salvation. Punk rock saved me from something. As punks, we'd make fun of guys playing softball. They'd make fun of us being punks. Same difference. I think it makes you younger longer, like where you just feel younger at heart. I do personally because we were just so into our surroundings and I don't feel like some old person, even though I'm 20 years older than I was back then. I just feel more um, fortunate with everything I went through. There's people out there in other countries, you know, that are well aware of what went on around yeah. here and after, you know, this whole Northeast Ohio scene. You know, so I guess that's something. Zero Defects drummer is a Somebody I remember. You remember the guy who used to dive and drum, play the thing, they jump back about 10 feet. I mean, the guy was totally up the hook. Is he the guy who used to play said, standing up and yeah, running on the yeah, drums? Yeah, okay, I remember that guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, that was yeah. anything like it. I mean, it was <laughs> inspirational. I saved, you know, all the records I bought and all the fanzines I bought, and I had good memories about what happened. So, you know, it, it was fun with my business running a record label to go back and do some detective work and find all these bands and uh, find all their recordings and, and re-release them to a new generation of music fans. And it's kind of wild uh, to go to a foreign country and to walk into a record store and see, you know, there's that record for sale that you released that got put out by some Cleveland band that got recorded 20 years ago. <laughs> Probably could have spent that money on something a little more practical, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a it was an awesome time. Made uh, lots of good friends, uh, building a community. Got to get our yayas out at that age. Still haven't got them all out yet. Still working on that. It uh, showed me that I didn't have to have somebody employ me the rest of my life, but in the same sense that it might have been better to have somebody employ me the rest of my life. Not right where that nail hole is. Not making a whole lot of money. At one point, I guess some of our fans, some young kids, started a bicycle trick team and they named themselves after the offbeats. The guy wrote a letter on the back, actually. Tom. Dude, it's me again, Chris, Offbeat's trick team. Here's some flyers. If you would pass them to some big company that would be interested in sponsoring a trick team. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I don't know who they thought I was going to pass this along to. 
P.S. We need some stickers if you have any. That would be rad. I'll still listen to the offbeats or Plasma Alliance or, you know, Zero Defects, all those great bands that were around and they were as good back then to me as listening to them now. Punk rock changed my life. I realized that the problems I had were problems I had with where I came from, I was I was right, and I still think I'm right. Um, the, uh, just made me appreciate people a lot more. Um, be very uh, mentally cynical, but uh, very optimistic in your heart because you continuously just meet amazing people. You know, I went to Catholic high school. I went to Kent State to be a teacher, and then I was introduced to this whole other sector of society. And in a way, I'm sure it fucked me up, too, because it led me to be freer probably than I would have been. You know, like I got into a nasty heroin addiction for 10 years, and I don't know if I would have gone there if I hadn't, you know what I mean, allowed myself to branch out from the norm so early. But I'm definitely who I am today because of that, and that's a good thing. So many of the lessons of my life came from those years, came from like being in that scene, like, you know, just the basic stuff, like if somebody invites you to come and play a show in Cleveland, then you immediately have them play a show in Akron or Kent. It's like you, and, and, you, and you, you know, when you play with local bands, you split the door evenly, there's, you know, there's no headliner, there's like all this stupid, um, like, like ego bullshit that's just like net, net part of human nature was put aside for me because I had been around all these people who just had this basic like set of ethics that were that that uh, that, that seemed to me now to be a really good set of ethics that a lot of people didn't get exposed to in that way in, in, in a really like practical way when they were young and I did. I ended up becoming a Buddhist monk and a lot of people look at that and they say, Oh you became you know, you gave up punk rock and became a Buddhist monk. But to me, uh, Becoming a Buddhist monk was like the most punk rock thing you could possibly do. It was like the, the taking all of that to the to the ultimate ends. So. What do I do now? Uh, I do art for a living. I always have. I've mm -hmm. always been an artist. So what type of art do you do? Graphic arts. Now, all right. I'm a pornographer. That's what you want. You want the dirt. Uh, I do adult. Uh, anything. I work for Hustler. I work for Caballero. I work for Metro. I work for everybody and anybody that needs anything done. The adult industry does not have to, has never, never seemed to suffer from the recession that the rest of the country, mm -hmm. you know, there's always more and more of it, so it's always steady work. For the most part, America itself doesn't have this ceremony or this time that we set aside to give honor to the, the becoming of an adult. And I think that's what we were doing. We were creating our own ceremony to put one thing a pass and to take over our new position in society. It was fun um, being into something that was totally different at the time. Nobody else was into it and it gives you a, a level of confidence to be able to do something that's not mainstream. It was a magical moment. I'm glad to be part of that magic. No matter how much I've ever tried to shake it, I can never completely get it off my back. It's always there. There's always some vestige of punk rock in my life every day. Whether it's an attitude, whether it's a reaction to something, it has been shaped by um, how into punk rock I was. I don't think there's anything in my life I will ever be as completely enthusiastic about as I was about punk rock when I was about 17 years old. I never own it until I it's crossed in the grave. Go!